Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to our first 12 into 12 event here at the New America Foundation. My name is Andres Martinez. I'm a vice president and editorial director here at New America. Delve into 12 is our think tank's campaign blog and series of events where we take a look at policy issues being discussed or not being discussed, as the case may be, may be on the campaign trail, as well as looking at the nature of the discourse and the political culture that emanates from this election cycle. Before we begin, I just want to have a, say, a, put out a few housekeeping rules, which is to remind everybody uh, that this event is being webcast and it's going to be on C-SPAN and it's being recorded, so everything will be on the record, obviously. And uh, there'll be a couple of question sessions, so please, if you have a question or a comment to make during one of those sessions, uh, wait for a microphone and identify yourself. Now I'd like to uh, have you please turn your attention to the monitor, because I'd like to kick off the day with some of the nastiest political messaging ever. John, are we ready? Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like they, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical <laughs> character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames? Female chastity violated? Children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative elections... The candidates have taken dirty to a whole new... It can level. seem like a return to civility is not possible. So, uh, I don't know if you were able to see the attribution in the corner, but that was put together by our good friends at Reason magazine and Reason TV, so kudos to them. And I, I wanted to show that to sort of put us in, get us in the mood for the discussions that are going to come. And also as a, as to give us some perspective, because we always tend to want to believe that we live in the most interesting times, the most dire of times, and uh, I guess in some ways uh, things are, are relative, so it's kind of useful perspective. Um, with so many trans transcendent issues facing the nation, it may seem frivolous to kick off our Delve into 12 series with a session on advertising. But I would argue that it's actually the perfect starting point. Those of us here inside the proverbial beltway, or the literal beltway, tend to uh, mock 30-second commercials. We follow, you know, we read policy papers put out by campaigns. We follow every single blow in the campaign season on the trail and every debate, and we dissect everything. So it's easy to lose sight of the fact that for most Americans, uh, people out there in the real world doing productive, actual, real work. Um, this is how they engage politics for the most part. This is how people learn about uh, can candidates um, and make their informed decisions about. It's based a lot on these adver advertisements that some of us can sort of poo-poo as, as being um, superficial or whatnot. But for time-pressed Americans, this is how they engage politics. And there's no doubt that the predominance of negative advertising is already becoming the distinguishing characteristic of this 2012 election cycle. Um, I was a journalist, and those of us in the media tend to uh, bemoan and decry negative advertising. Journalists love bashing politicians, but we get squeamish when the politicians start bashing each other. And somehow, you know, that's, that's seen as a, a negative. Um, negative advertising is usually spoken about as a negative. But it's not entirely clear that this is 
something that's bad to our political culture. It does seem corrosive. It seems to erode public faith in, in our leaders. But I guess there's a case to be made that comparisons um, and adversarial uh, contests and advertising tends to bring out more core truths about candidates than, than do positive spots. So who's to say? So I, I don't think we're coming here today to presuppose that this is entirely a negative trend. Uh, but to put it in a context, not just going back to the election of 1800, um, we wanted to start off by looking at who is Daisy and how did the art of going nuclear in campaigns evolve from that famous spot that Lyndon Johnson ran against Barry Goldwater? How did we get from there to today? What is the cumulative effect of all this negative advertising on our political culture? And if nuclear, ne if nuclear campaign ads, if these negative ads are so effective, why don't commercial brands use the same types of tactics to go after their competitors? So I think that'll be an interesting discussion later on. So these are the issues and the questions that we're going to be considering today. Um, I'd like to now introduce my partner in moderation, Michael Duffy is the executive editor of Time and the magazine's former Washington bureau chief. Michael joined Time in 1985 as a Pentagon correspondent. He's covered Congress. He covered the first Bush presidency and the Clinton White House. He's won numerous journal journalism awards and written a couple of books. But most salingly, I should mention that his upcoming book, The President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity, uh, is coming out. It will be published by Simon & Schuster in April. And I'm, I, I know I, for one, am looking forward to reading that. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. My first job is to introduce someone who actually knows something about negative advertising um, and advertising in general, so I have to exit the stage quickly. Um, and it's Robert Mann, who has had a very interesting life and is the author of da Daisy Petals and Mushroom Clouds, LBJ, Barry Goldwater, and the ad that changed American politics. Um, Bob is the director of the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs at LSU, and has the quite remarkable distinction of having worked for three different Democratic senators from Louisiana and a governor of Louisiana. One of those four uh, was Russell Long, which makes him almost as old as I am, um, and uh, also an expert to tell us who can walk us back all the way through a, a much broader history of uh, negative advertising in America than um, we might get somewhere else. So Bob, come on up and start us off. Thank you, Michael. I'm delighted to, uh, to be here, and uh, Elizabeth is uh, cracking the whip today and urged me to keep this presentation to about 20 minutes. So this is going to be the speed reader's idiot's guide to uh, political advertising. We're going to go through this pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, so 47 years ago, a little bit more than 47 years ago, on the night of September 7th, 1964, an innocent little girl transformed political advertising with a 60-second spot that exploded, literally and figuratively, the way that American politicians sold themselves to the public. For years, Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee for president that year, had spoken recklessly about nuclear war. He joked about lobbing a missile into the men's room of the Kremlin. He suggested using nuclear bombs to defoliate the forests of Vietnam. He said the bomb was merely another weapon, and he made another, a number of other reckless comments that suggested that he was not serious when it came to the stewardship of the nuclear arsenal. The attacks on Goldwater by Johnson in 1964, most of it based on Goldwater's own statements, his reckless statements about a variety of issues, not just nuclear war, introduced into our politics a radically new way of communicating with voters. Examine any of the television spots created for presidential candidates in 1952, 1956, 1960, and then view Barry Goldwater's 1964 spots, and you will note, I believe, that there is no real creative progression from 1952 through 1964 until you get to um, the Lyndon Johnson campaign. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Uh, first, we're going to look at a few of the Eisenhower spots from 1952. They are creative mainly in the sense that they represent the first spot advertising in American politics, and we'll see those spots now.
Eisenhower answers America. They say we've never had it so good. Yet I've had to stop buying eggs. They're so expensive. No wonder. You actually pay 100 different taxes on just one egg. We must cut costs, which means we must cut taxes. Eisenhower answers America. General, how would you clean up the mess in Washington? My answer? It's not a one agency mess or even a one department mess. It's a top to bottom mess. And I promise we will clean it up from top to bottom. Eisenhower answers America. Can you cut taxes, Mr. Eisenhower? We can and will if you help. Taxes have gone up steadily for 15 years. The Democrats say they must go up still more. Help me put the lid on crazy government spending. Eisenhower answers America. My children hear so much about government graft, they think everyone is crooked. I know. Too many politicians have sold their ideals of honesty down the Potomac. We must bring back integrity and thrift to Washington. This we are determined to do. Eisenhower answers America. General, if war comes, is this country really ready? It is not. The administration has spent many billions for national defense. Yet today, we haven't enough planes for the fighting in Korea. It's time for a change. Eisenhower answers America. Today they say I never had it so good. Yet my pension won't even feed me and my wife. It's not just your pension. It's the same with our bonds, our savings, our social security. They've all gone down. Yes, it's time for a change. Eisenhower answers America. Mr. Eisenhower, what are you going to do about taxes? We are going to bring them down. And here's how. We are going to cut out the billions that Washington is wasting and put that money back in the pockets of the people. Eisenhower answers America. General, the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Can that be true when America is billions in debt, when prices have doubled, when taxes break our backs, and we are still fighting in Korea? It's tragic, and it's time for a change. Eisenhower answers America. General, just how bad is waste in Washington? How bad? Recently, just one government bureau actually lost $400 million, and not even the FBI can find it. It's really time for a change. Eisenhower answers America. I pay $24 for these groceries. Look, for this little? A few years ago, those same groceries cost you $10. Now, $24. Next year, $30. That's what will happen unless we have a change. Eisenhower answers America. Can you cut taxes, Mr. Eisenhower? We can and will. Today, an average man with one child has $1,200 in taxes squeezed out of his pay. Yet the Democrats say taxes must go up. But we will put the lid on government spending. Eisenhower answers America. I'm 66. I can't live on my Social Security. Nobody can. I stand for expanded Social Security and more real benefits. Believe me, sir, if I am president, I'll give you older folks action not just sympathy. Eisenhower answers America. We retired on less than a $2,000 pension, and at today's prices, we just can't live on it. With today's taxes and prices, you need over $4,000 to buy what $2,000 bought then. That's why I say, vote for a change. Eisenhower John, answers can we stop America. this and, and move ahead Mr. to the next Eisenhower. one? Okay, I'm sorry that that was that was many more than I originally wanted to play for you. But you get the idea. He ran uh, dozens of these, all 15 seconds, and they were really the first spot advertising and uh, the the first uh, and and maybe last for some time use of spot advertising like that in political campaigns. Now I want to move ahead and look at an Adelaide Stevenson spot from the same election. I, I, while, while John's getting that set up, I'll tell you that uh, in between takes Vote of that in November of that spot, Eisenhower muttered to an aide to think that an old general should come to this. 
it was a very degrading experience for Eisenhower. Old MacDonald had a farm back in 31. Conditions filled him with alarm back in 31. Not a chick chick here or a moo cow there, just broken down farmland everywhere. And Barber Mac doesn't want to go back to the days when there wasn't a moo or quack. To the days of 1931, when he didn't have bread when the day was done. Farmer Mac knows what to do, election day of 52. Gonna go out with everyone in the USA to vote for Adley Stevenson to keep his farm this way. With a vote vote here and a vote vote there and a vote for Stevenson everywhere. For if it's good for Mac, you see, it's good for you and it's good for me. All America loves that farm. Vote Stevenson today. Okay, so uh, uh, the jingles were very popular, and uh, even Kennedy used them in, uh, in, in his advertising. Now we're going to fast forward and look at a, uh, at, some, at a spot by Richard Nixon and, and John Kennedy. I think the Nixon, the uh, Kennedy spot may be the first one. This is the Sills family. Recently, John F. Kennedy visited the Sills. Mr. and Mrs. Sills are facing one of the great problems that all American families are now facing, and that is the great increase in the cost of living. Our rent has gone up, our food, our um, cleaning of our clothing, buying of the clothing, our gas and electric, and our telephone bills have gone up. What's been your experience, Mr. Sills, well, as keeping those two daughters of yours strong? Well, we're very concerned with their future. We would like both of them to go to college. Have you been able to put much aside? As no, as un unfortunately, not right now. One of the uh, things which I think has increased the cost of living has been this administration's reliance upon a high interest rate policy. My own judgment is that we're going to have to uh, try to do a better job in this field. Yes, we can do better. But to do so, we must elect the man who cares about America's problems. We must elect John F. Kennedy president. And next is a Nixon spot from 1960. Ladies and gentlemen, the vice president of the United States, Richard M. Nixon. I want to talk to you for a moment about civil rights, equal rights for all our citizens. Why must we vigorously defend them? First, because it is right and just. And second, because we cannot compete successfully with communism if we fail to utilize completely the minds and energies of all of our citizens. And third, the whole world is watching us. When we fail to grant equality to all, that makes news, bad news for America all over the world. Now the record shows there's been more progress in civil rights in the past eight years than in the preceding 80 years because this administration has insisted on making progress. And I want to continue and speed up that progress. I want to help build a better America for all Americans. So you'll notice that technically and, uh, and creatively, these spots don't really evolve much over the, through the 50s into the early 60s. And they rely almost entirely on fact-based appeals, no real emotion. Now I want to move four years into the future, to 1964, and watch a Barry Goldwater spot. Oh. Can you stop this, John? I, we, this, is, this is actually a little bit out, out, out of order. This is, the, this is a, a Volkswagen spot that Doyle Dame Bernback did. John Kennedy saw the spots that, that, that DDB was, were doing for various advertisers, including Volkswagen. And he told his brother-in-law, Steve Smith, go find me the firm that did these ads. I want them to advertise, do my ads in 1964. And this is how Doyle Dame Birnbach got the account in 1964 for Lyndon Johnson. This is a Volkswagen ad that they did.
Have you ever wondered how the man who drives a snowplow drives to the snowplow? This one drives a Volkswagen. So you can stop wondering. Okay, those, those spots are a little bit out of order, and that's my fault. But now we're going to look at the Goldwater spot, and I'll come back and put this in a bit of perspective. Don't look now, young man, but somebody has his hand in your pocket. It's the hand of big government. It's taking away about four months' pay from what your daddy earns every year, one dollar out of every three in his paycheck. And it's taking the security out of your grandmother's Social Security. You know, that's the great trouble with big inflationary government. It takes more and more of your earnings. It slowly but surely destroys individual initiative and responsibility. Government must draw its strength from the people. And as it drains away this strength, it must inevitably undermine the foundations of self-government. I ask you to join me in helping restore the individual freedoms and initiatives this nation once knew. To make government more the servant and not the master of us all. In this free nation, we do not choose to be ruled. We elect to be governed. In your heart, you know he's right. Vote for Barry Goldwater. So as you can see, the Goldwater spot is really kind of frozen in time. It's not much different from the spots that were shown a decade earlier. So now we arrive at the 1964 Johnson campaign and the spots that quite literally changed American politics. What would become known as the Daisy Girl spot was produced by Doyle Dane Burnback, was seen that night by an estimated 50 million people. And I would like to note that uh, one of the creators of the spot is with us today. Sid, would you, would you stand up or wave your hand? This is Sid Myers. Sid is a, a legend. <laughs> so, well, 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 that'll be determined later, I think. Uh, Sid is a legend in the advertising business, and uh, he was a senior art director for DDB in 1964 and was a key player in the creation of the Daisy Girl spot and some of the others that you'll see in a moment. He's joined here with some of his colleagues uh, with a new firm. They've created senior creative people, Chuck Schroeder, Ed uh, Giles, and, and Don uh, Blauweiss, and, and Sid's wife, Bonnie, are here as well. So I hope you'll get a chance to visit with him and talk to them. These are the original Mad Men right here that you're, you're, you're seeing. All right, so uh, we're going we're gonna to watch this spot, the Daisy Girl spot that was shown one time, only once, as a paid ad. One, two, three, four, five, seven, six, six, eight, nine, nine. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Notice that the spot never shows Goldwater's image, never mentions it name, its name. It's because they, they didn't have to. The, the information about Goldwater's position on nuclear weapons was already embedded in the, in the viewers' minds. They didn't need to provide information. They needed to provide context for that information. In the, follow, in the, the, the following week, or the, the following Monday, this is the spot that aired. Do you know what people used to do? They used to explode atomic bombs in the air. Now children should have lots of vitamin A and calcium, but they shouldn't have any strontium-90 or cesium-137. These things come from atomic bombs and they're radioactive. They can make you die. Do you know what people finally did? They got together and signed a nuclear test ban treaty and then the radioactive poison started to go away. But now, there's a man who wants to be President of the United States, and he doesn't like this treaty. He fought against it. He even voted against it. 
He wants to go on testing more bombs. His name is Barry Goldwater. And if he's elected, they might start testing all over again. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Here are another couple of spots that build on that theme of Goldwater as a, as a dangerous radical. This particular phone only rings in a serious crisis. Keep it in the hands of a man who's proven himself responsible. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. And this one uses Goldwater's words against him. On October 24th, 1963, Barry Goldwater said of the nuclear bomb, merely another weapon, merely another weapon. Vote for President Johnson. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Nuclear war wasn't the only subject that they were using against Goldwater. One spot that, that Sid was primarily responsible for ridiculed Goldwater's statement about sawing off the eastern seaboard of the United States. Saturday Evening Post article dated August 31st, 1963, Barry Goldwater said, Sometimes I think this country would be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and let it float out to sea. Can a man who makes statements like this be expected to serve all the people justly and fairly? Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Notice that there is a, a minimum amount of information in these spots, but they're very rich and very memorable images. That was the, one of the key innovations that Sid and his colleagues achieved in that year. The Daisy Girl spot and these other DDB spots, there were 27 of them in all, were the first spots that used creative advertising principles in a presidential campaign, except for those, the, 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 those little 15-second Eisenhower spots, which were kind of a, a burst of creativity that went away. Uh, they were the first in a political era in which presidential candidates increasingly and effectively used emotion, not reason, to win elections. The Daisy Girl spots, skillful manipulation of the fears residing in American viewers showed a new generation of political professionals that television advertising and campaigns was about far more than which candidate had the best facts. It was instead more about which candidate could give meaning to the facts and fears the voters already possessed. And today, the DNA of those spots is clearly still a part of political advertising. Allow me to show you just a few negative spots ranging from 1968 through 2008. Most of them represent something important that Sid and his colleagues created in 1964. First, I'll show you another Richard Nixon spot, this one from 1968. It's perhaps the first negative spot that went too far and uh, backfired. It suggested that Hubert Humphrey was indifferent to the death and carnage in Vietnam. Okay, the next spot is we're going to jump ahead a few years from 1988. It's the famous Willie Horton spot that was aired by a third party group on behalf of George H.W. Bush. It's a good example of how an existing narrative about a candidate can be put to good use in an advertising campaign. It's also a demonstration that ads 
uh, can not only create news but can help create uh, uh, synergism in which the ad and the news about the issue meld together to create something larger than the sum of their parts. Let's see that spot now. There is a bear in the woods. For some people, the bear is easy to see. Others don't see it at all. Some people say the bear is tame. Others say it's vicious and dangerous. Since no one can really be sure who's right, isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? If there is a bear. Okay, that's my fault. Uh, that's Ronald Reagan's 88 campaign, the famous bear spot, which I think is a very good use of, of parable in advertising and demonstrates like the Daisy Girl spot that uh, existing narratives in the viewer's mind can be uh, uh, be put to use and, and don't require lots of factual information. I think now we'll see the, the uh, Willie Horton spot. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. Uh, Jane Mayer, who's on the, on the program today, wrote a very interesting piece in The New Yorker recently about that spot, and I commend it to you. Now to 2004, one of the famous Swift Boat ads aimed at John Kerry's record in Vietnam. Um, these were originally shown on cable, and uh, it was a small ad buy, but it's a great example of how to use negative advertising to create news. They had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads. The accusations that John Kerry made against the veterans who served in Vietnam was just devastating. Randomly shot at civilians. And it hurt me more than any physical wounds I had. Cut off limbs, blown up bodies. That was part of the torture, was uh, to sign a statement that you had committed war crimes. Raised villages in the fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan. John Kerry gave the enemy for free what I and many of my uh, comrades in, in North Vietnam in the prison camps uh, took torture to avoid saying. It demoralized us. Crimes committed on a day-to-day -day basis. He betrayed us in the past. How could we be loyal to him now? Ravaged the countryside of South Vietnam. He dishonored his country and uh, more, more importantly the people he served with. He just sold them out. Swift Boat Veterans for Truth is responsible for the content of this advertisement. Finally, here's a spot from 2008 in which the Obama campaign uses John McCain's statements about the economy against him. It's in the spirit of the DDB ads from 64 in which Johnson used Goldwater's statements against him, including those about Social Security and nuclear war and other issues, to very good effect. I think still the fundamentals are of our economy are strong. The fundamentals are of our economy are strong. The fundamentals are of our economy are strong. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. So, as you can see from this very quick review, uh, the spirit of Daisy Girl using emotions already in the hearts and minds of uh, voters and bringing them to the surface lives on increasingly in sophisticated advertising campaigns. The 1964 campaign introduced fear, primarily, but not only fear, but fear is a powerful emotion in politics, and it showed in many ways that in this new era of political advertising and campaigning that virtually anything uh, could be fair game if, uh, in some cases, if misused. Uh, and I would think, I would, I would point, hasten to point out that Sid argues very persuasively, and I, and I, believe, and I believe him, that they did not misuse the truth uh, but we've, we've, we've seen cases where it has been. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that much of the political world we experience today was born in the presidential campaign of 1964. Emotion, especially fear, as a tool of politicians and their advertising consultants, as we will discuss in a few minutes, is here to stay. Thanks very much.